Now, dear listener, you know I've talked to you a lot on the Politocrat Daily Podcast about making your own podcast. And let me tell you something. Anchor gives you the best opportunity to do that. It's free of charge. Yes, it's free. And there are lots of creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your own phone or computer. How about that? And you can even add songs to your podcast from Spotify. It's really wonderful. You can do this. And it really is very easy. And Anchor will even distribute your podcast for you. It can be heard on all kinds of platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. And you can make some money too. And money making is a good thing. It's everything you need in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Welcome to The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. It is Wednesday, May the 19th, 2021. On this edition of The Politocrat... I'm Paul Mooney. Welcome to Analyzing White America. It's a very difficult job, and I'm just the man for it. 9-11, it's a different world, ain't it? And shock, just stunned. And it took that to make white folks realize that we're human beings. Hello. Yeah, you understand? You know, because they were so worried about us. They so, America is so worried about black folks. They were so worried about the land niggas, they forgot about the sand niggas. Now, a lot of you are clap. A lot of you are clapping. A lot of you house niggas are scared. Just... <laughs> you going to get us in trouble. No emotion, no reaction. You black, you live in America, you in trouble. I can't get you in no trouble. So worried about us, huh? And then the rumors started. They said it was black folks. It was black folks. Black folks did that. I knew there wasn't no black people. Ain't no niggas did that. We don't commit suicide. No. If that had been black people flying that plane, you'd have saw, saw a whole bunch of parachutes. And do rags. Nine eleven, and I want to thank, on behalf of Black America, because I'm a black person, I want to thank White America. Thank you, thank you, White America, for making us tough. Because we'll get through this terrorist stuff. You made us. White folks made us tough, because they've been terrorizing us for five hundred years. Sicking dogs, putting water holes, lynching us. We used to terrorists. This ain't no big deal to us. I'm worried about white folks. I'm worried about my white friends. They ain't going to make it through this. They're not used to this. I've, I've lost two or three white friends. They've cracked up. Take, they took them to the crazy house. They can't handle this. They asked me for my ID at least five times. Dude, what the hell do they want from me? They can't handle this profiling. The one and only Paul Mooney has passed at the age of 79. Next, remembering Paul Mooney. White folks, don't try this at home by yourself. You might hurt yourself. <laughs> Paul Mooney. <laughs> and I do want to, of course, as you probably have guessed, um, a lot of uh, racial epithets being used, uh, uh, not by yours truly, but by the godfather of comedy, Paul Mooney. And I say that with great affection for him. And no, I'm not a fan of that horrible, wretched word at all. Never have been, never will be. And I am not for anybody saying it. Um, Paul Mooney, uh, who is no longer with us, used that word, um, every other word, and uh, obviously used it as part of his comedy routine. Uh, but what Paul Mooney did was not just a routine, it was so much more. 
And on this particular day, May the 19th, 2021, dear listener, um, it's it's a sorrowful day. Um, but some would say it's a happy day as well, um, because poor Mooney um, is now with the ancestors celebrating and having a lot of great conversations, I'm sure, with the likes of a Dick Gregory, with the likes of a Richard Pryor. Heck, you know, maybe Robin Williams is um, getting some tips from Paul Mooney because Robin Williams, I'm sure, um, and I don't know if he ever did, but he really does owe, as do all comedians, a great debt to the one, the only Paul Mooney. Paul Mooney was a truth teller. And comedy comes from pain. Comedy comes from truth. And that is why people are able to laugh. Because they know that what a comedian is saying is damn well true. If it wasn't true, nobody would find it funny enough to laugh at it. And that laughter is born of a discomfort that the people laughing know well and know deeply. And Paul Mooney was a genius in bringing that truth to the foreground and in your face. He was not only fearless, he was ahead of his time. And... What is profoundly interesting to me, dear listener, is that Paul Mooney passed away on the very same day as Malcolm X had a birthday. And Malcolm X, had he been alive, would have enjoyed yet another birthday on this day, May 19th. And to me, Paul Mooney was the Malcolm X of comedy. And perhaps some people listening to what I just said may find that to be an awkward or inapposite thing to say. But if you had the privilege and honor of seeing Paul Mooney live on stage, as I did on no less than at least four different occasions, and I was sitting in the front row every time, then... You will understand why I call Paul Mooney the Malcolm X of comedy. Paul Mooney was a comedic genius. And even more importantly than that, he was a really good person who was honest and direct and spoke truth and specialized with his comedy in making you uncomfortable. That laugh that you are laughing from hilarity and discomfort at the same time? Well, Paul dialed that up to number 11 on volume. And that volume switch never came down from 11 and probably, I would say, rose past 11, 12, 13, 14. He confronted white people directly. And I remember watching Paul at Caroline's Comedy Club in New York City. It was always the late show. He sometimes did the earlier show. But I've watched him, and I did watch him, live at the earlier show and the late show. And the late show was always the best one to go to. And he was always great. And I always counted the number of white people who would walk out of his shows, never to return to their seats. I would watch as Paul made fun of them as they left. I watched as Paul would get the audience to laugh at those white persons as they left. And usually, by the time the routine was over, you'd probably have at least five white couples walking out of a Paul Mooney comedy set before the routine was done. It was one of the great things that, I mean, I, I've, 
one of the greatest gifts is to be so good at what you do as a comedian that you actually force that comedic truth and that reality. You actually make people so uncomfortable that they actually leave. And it's not that Paul Mooney, in my opinion, was offending white people. It was that Paul Mooney told the truth about white people. And only the bravest and hardiest the bravest and hardiest white souls would remain in their seats and would applaud Paul for the truth that they knew. And the black people, none of whom walked out, were uproarious and joyful for the hour and a half or two hours that Paul Mooney would spend with us talking about black people, talking about white people, talking about celebrities. Nobody was safe. And as you've heard in the clips I've played and those clips that you've heard came from Paul Mooney's comedy called Analyzing White America. I do urge you to watch the entirety of that 58 plus minutes. It's available on YouTube. It's also available to purchase. It's called Paul Mooney's Analyzing White America. Paul Mooney was one of the greatest, I think. And people will talk about Dick Gregory. And and I obviously am a huge fan of Dick Gregory's. People will talk about George Collins. And I'm a huge fan of George Collins. People will talk about Lenny Bruce. People will talk about Richard Pryor. People will talk about Moms Mabley. And all manner of comedians. Dave Chappelle and Chris Rock and some more and Bill Bellamy and even comedians right now like Amanda Searles who I I think is just incredible. She is just excellent. But to me, Paul Mooney was the person who was the godfather of comedy, even though he came along after Dick Gregory did. Not only was Paul Mooney cutting edge, I mean, that's kind of a tame term to use for him. Paul Mooney did not give a fuck about how you or I felt about what he had to say. And Paul Mooney was someone who was extremely sharp. And if I may say, he was one of those rare human beings who used more than 8% of their brain. Paul was sharper than sharp, quick-witted, thought-provoking, a powerhouse. He was the quintessential critical thinker, a comedian and a human being in general who always kept you on your toes. He interacted with the audiences, and I remember him interacting with me briefly, on something to do with a celebrity and I think it was Tom Cruise because I went to his shows back in the early 2000s and Tom Cruise was in a movie um, called The Last Samurai and (laughs) Paul Mooney made some incredible jokes (laughs) but these are truth bombs about Tom Cruise being in that movie playing the, the role of a Japanese person, a samurai. And I remember interacting with with Paul about that um, because, you know, he would interact with people in the audience. 
and he said, I think I remember, if I remember it correctly, he said, imagine you being <laughs> the last, I think he said the last, I don't even remember. It's been a long time. So I can't give the exact remembrance of it. But all I remember is, is that before he finished saying what he was saying to me and to everybody at Caroline's Comedy Club in New York City, I was rolling in laughter and tears. Because when Paul Mooney said something, you literally couldn't find your breath. It was so funny. But Paul taught you history. Paul taught you lessons and he told you the truth. One of the geniuses, I think he was a comedic genius. And he was the critical thinker of comedy. Dick Gregory was as well. George Carlin was as well. I'd put those two individuals squarely in that realm of critical thinkers of comedy. Paul Mooney was one of them. And I think the best comedians are the best critical thinkers because they do have you thinking and laughing at the same time. There were no sacred cows with Paul on or off stage. Paul loved us as black people. Paul Mooney absolutely cared about us as black people. And he had some tough love for us, both on stage and off it. He was never afraid to speak about what he saw and observe about the world around him, about the world we are all living in. And he never ever spared anybody. He made jokes about Whoopi Goldberg, Diana Ross, President Obama, and any white person you can think of. He made jokes about white people in the audience. Paul Mooney was always prepared. And not only that, he, as I said earlier, dropped history. He dropped the history on you. He made jokes about Elizabeth Taylor. He made jokes about Cleopatra. <laughs> I think the last time I saw Paul Mooney live, he made this joke about not Elizabeth Taylor playing <laughs> Cleopatra, but although he did make jokes about that too, but he made these jokes about <laughs> Cleopatra. <laughs> and tossing salad. <laughs> Cleopatra was a black woman. And there's just this... I can't even repeat it. <laughs> In the true Paul Mooney tradition, I should repeat it, but I'm not going to. <laughs> This was <laughs> poor Mooney. X rated was kind of, he'd laugh at X rated. He would laugh, I mean, he was beyond that. He would laugh at it. You know, you have to understand something, dear listener. If you do not know who Pool, well, if you do not know Pool, if you do not know who Paul Mooney was, you really do need to go on YouTube and you need to type his name in. This was a brother who enlightened and made you uncomfortable, no matter who you were. But it wasn't so much that I personally felt uncomfortable by Paul Mooney. I felt uplifted by him. Paul Mooney, I think, for me, offered a safe haven to speak the truth, to be unapologetic in the truth and in your truth that you speak. That's one of the things I learned from him. And I've often said on this podcast 
that you have to be uncomfortable and you have to be uncomfortable with the state of the world that you are living in. And that's not to say that you cannot find joy and love and beauty and brilliance and special moments and cherished moments in your life. Of course you can. But as to the state and the condition of the world that you are living in, I honestly feel that you are obligated to be uncomfortable with the way the world is. Because if you're not, then even if you are by your very definition, not uncomfortable with the world you're living in, you're complicit in the world that you are living in. That unjust world that we all are living in. The one where the Israeli government unmercifully bombs and murders Palestinian women, children and men. The one where the United States of America continues to give the Israeli government billions of dollars of year, a year and provide billions of dollars of weaponry that the Israeli government and the army fires at Palestinian women, children and men. Paul Mooney talked about these kinds of things on stage. He would talk about O.J. Simpson. He would talk about Nicole Brown Simpson. He would talk about Ron Goldman. He would talk about all of the current affairs. I guarantee you. Whereas a lot of comedians would shy away from the topic du jour. Paul Mooney would go there and keep going there and hit there with a sledgehammer. More from me, yours truly, on Paul Mooney, my thoughts, and my tribute to him. Coming up right after this. Real quick, I have to make a shout out. Today is one of my favorite comedians that's ever lived's birthday. So I wanted to just film you guys wishing him a happy birthday. This motherfucker is turning 79 today. This motherfucker is a comedy legend and only other legends would understand. You're the best. You're one of the greatest comedians I've ever seen in any era. And you're my hero. Happy birthday, Paul Mooney. I love you. That was Dave Chappelle last August, August the 4th, 2020, celebrating the late, great, and now ancestor, Paul Mooney's 79th birthday. He was on stage, as you could tell there, doing a comedy routine, uh, doing some stand-up, and he took the time to praise the man who wrote a lot of his material, certainly wrote for his show, Paul Mooney was um, that kind of brother, that kind of person, really um, someone who wrote for a lot of different comedians. A lot of those jokes that Dave Chappelle told and is still telling come from the mind and the pen of Mr. Paul Mooney. And uh, I want to thank Paul Mooney's family for providing that clip if you go to Paul Mooney's Twitter page at Paul E A L Y Mooney, spelt M as in Mike O O N as in Norris E Y, you will see that clip of Dave Chappelle on stage last August 4th, 2020, giving a birthday shout out. And I have to thank the family um, of. Uh, Mr. Paul Mooney, and, and first for um, for supplying some of these clips, or certainly this clip with Dave Chappelle. But even more than that, my deepest condolences to the family of 
Mr. Paul Mooney. Because sometimes I think in our celebration and tributes to the life of someone that we really care about when they have departed us and gone on to their home going and their ancestral resting place. Um, sometimes we do forget some of us to send those deepest heartfelt condolences to the persons who are hit hardest by the departure of their loved one. And that obviously is the family member and the family members, in this case of Mr. Paul Mooney, who obviously are deeply hurting right now. Um, so we must remember them and we must keep them in our hearts and uh, top of mind as this Wednesday, May 19th um, is here. And you may be able to hear some of the very windy a uh, gusty San Francisco wind because there is a lot of it here today. Um, but it's so interesting because, you know, Paul Mooney uh, lived in Oakland and he um, passed away in Oakland just this morning. Oakland, California, which is just 13 miles away from here in San Francisco, just 13 miles away across the Bay Bridge, the San Francisco Bay Bridge. And it was a really sudden passing, apparently, according to Roland Martin, who I talk about here often. Roland Martin is a really important figure, um, one of the greats in media and entertainment and education and edutainment, or let's say more education, Roland Martin does his show from Monday through Friday called Roland Martin Unfiltered. It's on YouTube from 6 p.m. Eastern Time every day, Monday through Friday, as I say. And you've really got to watch that show. Um, black media owned and black media excellence is Roland Martin. He personifies excellence in media and excellence in, in, um, in all of the things that he does and works so hard to bring you the news about what's going on in the United States from a black perspective. And really that is the perspective that is needed. And Roland Martin is one of those people who brings that every day. And um, it was Roland Martin who broke this news about uh, Paul Mooney passing. I was shocked. And thankfully he was the one who broke the news. Paul Mooney was not, obviously, I mean, he talked about this on stage. He was no fan of the white press. He was no fan of them uh, at all, really. And championed black people and championed black media. And was always one to give interviews to black media. Which, there are some black celebrities and black stars who don't want anything to do with black media. Who won't give an interview um, and so, or certainly won't make their black media their first stop on the media tour. It would probably be their last, or if that at all. But Paul Mooney was always one to give the black press the interviews first. And in keeping with tradition, even in his passing, um, it, was, it was a black press person who broke the news the sad news and the shockingly sad news of the departure of Mr. Paul Mooney, who apparently, as Roland Martin tells it, according to uh, Paul's cousin, um, Rudy Ely, whom Paul lived with for the last few years of Paul's life, um, Paul had suffered from, uh, had a real battle with dementia, dementia suffered from dementia, in the last few years of his life. And apparently, according to his cousin Rudy Ely in Oakland, where Paul lived with Rudy, um, Paul had asked Rudy to go and make him a peanut butter sandwich. And that's exactly what Rudy did at around four o'clock or five o'clock this morning, Pacific time, in the morning, Pacific US time. And once he made the sandwich, Rudy, and brought it out, he found that Paul Mooney was unresponsive. And so 
he tried to actually administer CPR and help to Paul to revive him. And of course, the paramedics tried. And word has it, and I heard this on Roland Martin's show um, this evening, uh, if you will, um, you know, today, uh, literally not too long ago um, that I'm recording this. And apparently, they were all white paramedics. And the white paramedics were actually saying, we've got to do everything to save this man. This is Paul Mooney here. And I found that to be particularly interesting, given the fact that Paul Mooney would not hold back about white people and about the kinds of things that this racist white society has done to black people and the kinds of things a racist white society leaves white people with this impression that they, as a group, somehow have this greater power over everyone else. And Paul Mooney would really attack that and absolutely skew it. And hence, white people walking out, some white people walking out of his comedy shows. And the thing that was interesting is, is that they'd already paid Paul Mooney's, <laughs> they'd already paid Paul Mooney's money because Paul Mooney would obviously get part of the gate from the ticket sales to Caroline's or wherever he would perform around the country and beyond. So really they were walking out on their own money. I I'm, I kid you not. You know, I I was at those shows. I went to those shows in New York City. And I kid you not, every show I went to with Paul Mooney over the years to see him resulted in at least five or six white couples, or white people, period, but just white couples getting up and walking out. I mean, that was Paul Mooney. And Paul Mooney spoke the truth and that's what a comedian does. Not like Michael Richards who just said N, N, N and said it with the venom and the hatred that which he, with which he meant it. And while I didn't agree with Paul Mooney using that word, he used it in a way that was both tough love and affectionate, even though I have a real problem with that word used in any context. But this isn't about what my problems with the word are. And I do have problems with that word in every sense. This is really about Paul Mooney and the kind of person he was. He wrote for Richard Pryor. He wrote a great amount of Paul, excuse me, of Richard Pryor's material. He would tell stories about Richard Pryor and Dolly Parton. And he would tell stories about all of these people when he would do his comedy routines. It was purely no holds barred with Paul Mooney. Paul starred in a number of movies, including Hollywood Shuffle. He featured in that movie, playing the Hollywood NAACP representative. What was so interesting is, is that the American... Uh, film channel you know, on cable called Turner Classic Movies literally showed Hollywood Shuffle aired Robert Townsend's fine debut feature film a couple of nights ago. And I tweeted about Paul Mooney when I saw him in that moment during Hollywood Shuffle where he plays the NAACP Hollywood representative. And of course it's a funny moment. And I tweeted about it and a few hours later, just yesterday, Tuesday, May the 18th, 2021, I received a response from Paul Mooney, who at that time, I did not know, by the way, um, I never knew Paul Mooney had dementia. I was not aware of that. 
So I believed it was Paul Mooney himself. And may, who knows, maybe it was Paul Mooney tweeting. Um, but this came from his verified Twitter account. And the response from his account was, thanks for this. And I thought that I was so touched by that. And that was just yesterday. I was so touched by that. And I think the actual tweet was, thank you for this. And I wrote back to him and I said to him, you're welcome, sir. Sir Paul, king of comedy and undisputed. Take your praise. You've more than earned it. Much respect to you. I tweeted that back to Paul Mooney, to his Twitter account at Paul Ely Mooney. That's at Paul E A L Y Mooney. M O O N E Y. And I did that just yesterday. Just yesterday. As a matter of fact, almost exactly 24 hours from the time that I'm speaking these very words right now. Incredible. Literally three minutes short of that. Two minutes short of that. Of course, that won't mean anything to you listening to this when you listen to this. But in the moment, as I record this, I tweeted that two minutes short of exactly 24 hours ago. And... Less than 10 hours after that tweet. Paul Mooney made his transition. This episode of The Politocrat contains racial epithets and other language that some may find objectionable. Listener discretion is advised. And them white people who taught them Middle Eastern folks to fly in Miami ought to be put under the jail. Lock them all up. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know what was going on. Them 12 million East people went down there in Miami and learned to fly. I bet 12 niggas couldn't have did that. 12 niggas would have went there to a flight school. The FBI would have been there the next hour. What are you niggas up to? Since when was there an airport in Harlem? World War II, we was fighting on the white folks' side, and they didn't want to teach us to fly. But they said that they're teaching the Middle Eastern folks, who was up in class talking about, hey, 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 how you make you turn? <laughs> Sir, this is the part where we learn. No land, no land. How you make you turn? You, you, you teach me karate? baby, baby, baby. And the building fell, the walls came tumbling down. Didn't it? White folks got scared. White folks got scared. White folks were scared. When white folks get scared, I get scared. White folks were scared. I ain't seen white folks this scared since the last Indian raid. Paul Mooney from his comedy show... Analyzing White America, which, by the way, you can purchase, but it's also on YouTube for free um, as well. Um, you know, I, 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 I uh, Paul Mooney, what you heard there is Paul Mooney as he was. And as I say, Paul Mooney would challenge you. He would challenge white people um, in particular because he wasn't going to let... Um, Anybody, particularly white people, get away with, 
You know, those t-shirts where you see white people wearing the t-shirts that say even white people are tired of white people's bullshit? You've seen those t-shirts around. At least some of you have. And I I know certainly some of the uh, persons listening who are white to me, who are listening to me right now, I'm sure you've seen these t-shirts. Well, Paul Mooney was not allowed, was not going to allow anybody white to get away with their bullshit. (laughs) Or in other words, what I would call their racism. Paul Mooney was never, if you were white going to a Paul Mooney comedy show, you knew what you were going in for. And you knew what you would be in for. And if you were black going to a Paul Mooney show, you knew that you weren't safe either. I remember when Paul Mooney had this heckler who was black. And I was, again, I kid you not, I was at this one show. I think I I saw all of the Paul Mooney shows at Caroline's in New York, all the ones I went to. Um, He he went to so many different places to perform his stand-up. And he's one of the greatest stand-up comedians of all time. I really do think I, I would put him in the top two or three of all time. He really made you think. And I remember when I went to one of the shows, there was a black man heckling Paul Mooney. And Paul Mooney was not having it. Sit your funky ass down. And, you know, and of course he said, and, and this and, and that. You better get your ass on out of here. And da 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 da. You know, and, 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 and. And of course, everybody laughed. And I think that's the only black person that ever walked out <laughs> of a Paul Mooney show. I, I said earlier that no black person walked out. I have to correct myself. That was the only time, <laughs> at least that I am aware of, <laughs> I got to see it firsthand that a black person actually walked out of a show. But Paul Mooney would challenge you and you were not safe. And I don't say that as a scare thing. I say that as a love thing. Paul Mooney cared about you. And he cared enough to rattle you or he cared enough to challenge your belief or perception or challenge your conventional thinking. He was such a great critical thinker, as I said earlier. And he harnessed that on and off stage. In interviews, he would throw curveballs at the interviewer. And he really did break down the conventions of things and obliterate them. As I said, I think Paul Mooney was someone who used more than 8% of his brain. The average human being uses barely 8% of their brain. Barely. I think Paul Mooney used maybe 20% of his brain, 30% of his brain compared to the rest of us. This is, or was, sadly was, a brother who was constantly thinking and constantly talking and laughing and challenging you and telling you the truth and speaking truth to power and absolutely obliterating The white society and the white power structure and the racists in his comedy and absolutely laying waste to that whole system and just exposing it, but not only exposing it, but stomping on it and desecrating it and indicting it. And having you laugh at that too, as he was doing it. And one of the things that you will know when you watch Analyzing White America, Paul Mooney's Analyzing White America, you will see crowd shots. 
and of the few white people you would see when the camera panned into the audience, none of those people, very few of them would be laughing at all. They wouldn't be laughing. It would be like Donald Trump when President Obama at the White House Correspondents' Dinner a few years back told these very tame jokes about Donald Trump. Funny ones, but tame. And Paul, I mean, and, you know, Donald Trump would sit there and, of course, he'd pretend to laugh. He didn't laugh. And that's how it was when Paul Mooney was telling jokes and talking about white people, as you heard in that clip from Analyzing White America. And the camera would pan over and there's a one, there's one white person, there's a white woman sitting there and she was not having it. Not having it at all. Not finding any of it funny. Not at all. Can you imagine if Paul Mooney had been ripping on Donald Trump at that White House correspondence dinner instead of President Obama? Donald Trump would have got up and walked out of there. There's no question about it. Comedians owe Paul Mooney a great debt, as I said earlier. He wrote for so many of them, including Dave Chappelle, as I mentioned, Richard Pryor, and a whole host of others. He mentored people. He appeared, as I said, in uh, in Robert Townsend's film Hollywood Shuffle. He appeared in Spike Lee's film Bamboozled, more or less playing himself. It was a... It was a really... uh, You know, I talk about Paul... Mooney, as if I really knew him well. And I felt that even though I didn't know him personally, I had seen him often in New York. I'd seen him obviously on the stage four times, but four memorable times up close and personal. And the moments he'd make eye contact with me and that look that he would have on his face when he (laughs) would say a joke and drop a truth bomb and speak truth to power, and he'd give you that little look, you know? (laughs) And that look, and you just sat there laughing at him, and he'd look at me, and I remember making eye contact with him, and yeah, man, I, 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 you know, that's something special for me. And yes, it's very selfish and self-indulgent, but that's my memory. That's a precious memory for me of Paul Mooney. And spending money at Caroline's to see him and knowing that he got a percentage of that money. Spending it with someone who looked like me. That's one of the things that I was so happy about. And not only that, but knowing that I got to see someone who looked like me up there on stage speaking the truth about this racist society that we all live in, about the many of the white people in that society who practice that racist attitude and have it every day of their lives, that anti-blackness that many of those white individuals have and have still. And the Paul Mooney, could walk into that room as a black man and just absolutely desecrate and absolutely drop the bomb on those racist people who would be doing these kinds of things every day in their attitudes and in the way they think about black people, about brown folk, about native people about Asian people and for Paul freaking Mooney to drop that bomb. All hot sauce. No water. Straight vodka. No chases. Absolutely blistering. There's no such thing as an apology. Paul Mooney 
wasn't apologizing because there's nothing to apologize for. Paul Mooney was only speaking about the racist society that he, you, me, and all of us find ourselves still living in. No reason to get upset at Paul Mooney. It's like Malcolm X. And I know some people will find the analogy to be inapposite. Oh, Malcolm X said this when he came back from Mecca in 1964. And I'm paraphrasing this now. The Negro cannot be blamed for his animosity towards white people. He is only reflecting and responding and reacting to the hatreds. He is only reacting to the hatred and the racist behavior and discrimination and violence visited upon him and her and them by white men and some white women, white people in the United States of America. Malcolm X said this, the black man is not And the black woman is not a racist. We're only responding to the 400 plus years of the white terrorism and violence and discrimination being perpetrated against us and in a system that hates us. A system of anti-blackness. A system of hatred and oppression and enslavement. Paul Mooney was speaking that to that audience. Half of that audience was white. Half of it was black. And a good number of those white audiences vacated the building, left the building, like Elvis. Y'all think I'm cruel. I ain't cruel. Just like that old shaking truck driving bitch, Janet Reno, another crazy, just a shake. All that bitch does shake, Janet Reno. The bitch shakes. The bitch could do a shake and bake commercial. Oh, she ain't the only shaking bitch. That Captain Hepburn, another shaking one. I watched her on a movie on Lifetime, I had to hold my TV. It's just a shaking. They shake, they shake. Muhammad Ali, another shaking one. Yo, he does shake. Gave that nigga the torch and scared the shit out of me. Turn the gas off. Turn it off. That nigga gonna blow some shit up. Crackhead chased that nigga for 10 blocks trying to get a light. That was Paul Mooney from... (laughs) Oh, please excuse me, you know. Um... Paul Mooney's Analyzing White America. That, by the way, that's from 2002 was when um, that comedy uh, show was released. Um, (laughs) I don't know how your corporate news media is talking about Paul Mooney. I don't really care. Honestly, I, I don't care about how CBS remembers Paul Mooney, if they remember him at all, or CNN, or MSNBC, he'll, he'll screw Fox. Fox can go, you know. I don't care how any of them refer to or remember or tribute Paul Mooney because they ain't going to tell. They are not going to tell the truth about him. They're not. And they may have a black face or two. A black face as a black, in terms of a black person's face, not as black face. Because that film Bamboozled Spike Lee did is a really good one about the black face minstrel industry in Hollywood. Racism and anti-blackness. And you've got to watch that film from 2000. Um, One of the films that has really not been seen a lot by a lot of people, but I think over the years... um, is is being more appreciated as more people do see it, is that film, 
um, from Spike Lee called Bamboozled, which Roger Ebert panned at the time. And I just think he put Roger Ebert and, and Gene Siskel got that wrong. But I look, it's not about Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel. Um, it's about the fact that Paul Mooney was one of us. Paul Mooney was somebody who would have been right at home in the barbershop. And that's not to trivialize Paul Mooney or to trivialize those in the barbershop. The, the folks in the barbershop were funny like this. The folks, and I'm not saying like this as in, maybe, again, I know, look, people will certainly object to some of the things that Paul Mooney said. Uh, I certainly can understand uh, why someone would have an issue with what you heard in part of that clip just played. I, I, I'm simply saying to you that Paul Mooney was authentic and never anything but. And the thing about Paul Mooney is is that he did not spare anybody. And that is the point of why that clip was just played. And I'm not uh, going to have to try to justify anything that I do here in terms of Paul Mooney. Paul Mooney... um, was no different from the person in the barbershop. The barbershop was where you spoke your truth and you were raw. And even that word is kind of a trivial word to describe Paul Mooney. Paul Mooney was ahead of his time. Paul Mooney was ahead of a lot of people's times. And Paul Mooney as ahead of his time as he was, knew what time it was. And he was always right on time. He was the truth. And he was a truth teller. And I'll never forget Paul Mooney. I'll never forget how he touched me and how he challenged me. And how he made me laugh and cry at the same time. But the laughter and the crying were always joyous. He made me think. He made me really think. And even though I would like to think that before I saw Paul Mooney, I was a critical thinker. And I was. I will always say what I know to be true. And one of those things is that Paul Mooney further enhanced the critical thinking that I have. And I don't think his show and I don't think his comedy would ever have worked if he had done it any other way. Paul Mooney was at home with himself on that stage. And comedians today pull a lot of their punches. They are afraid of having their careers ended. They are afraid of having the Twitter Twitter bots and Twitter trolls all over them. Paul Mooney didn't give a damn about any of that. And Paul Mooney didn't care about fame. He cared about the truth and he cared about his people. And he cared about educating people because that's what Paul Mooney did. He was an educator and he was an educator on and off the stage. If you ever got to see Paul Mooney live, you could never ever say, to anyone that you came away from that experience for those two hours not being educated by Paul. It would just be impossible and it would also furthermore be a lie. Paul Mooney was an educator. He was an activist. And when he was on stage, he embodied activism. 
He embodied all of those things. Paul Mooney was a man of the people. He cared about his people. He loved us. He challenged us. And that was his act of tough love for us. He gave us advice. He gave fellow black comedians advice. He was a mentor to so many. And I do think he was one of the two or three greatest comedians of all time. I really do. Dick Gregory, George Carlin, and Paul Mooney. Paul Mooney was the godfather of comedy. And even more importantly than that, he was a really good human being. Rest in power, sir. The angels are laughing already. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore. And they don't want to give us credit. Why don't white folks want to give us credit? They don't want to give niggas credit. We built the White House. We built that. The white, it was working. The white folks got mad. When they finish, call it the White House. <laughs> niggas think they're doing something. Call it the goddamn White House. Don't you ever forget it. Yeah, you build it, nigga, but we're going to call it the White House. To make niggas mad. We built pyramids. Trust me. We built them. We built them so good, we forgot how we built them. Because we didn't white, want white folks stealing from us. How you build them, nigga? I forgot. <laughs> and white folks want Cleopatra to be white so bad. They tell so many lies. Elizabeth Taylor, Colbert, Colbert, that woman wasn't white. Oh, she was part Greek. You may have Greek blood in you that don't make you fucking white. You're crazy. Because of what she did, that's why. If she'd have been a white woman, look, Cleopatra was black. If she'd have been a white woman, that, that was during the white times. Look, the Romans, give them the credit. They ruled the world for 3,000 years. It took them 300 years for Rome to fall. Give credit where credit is due. And they were freaks. They ruled it in miniskirts. Give it up to them. And they were white. We give it up. But Cleopatra was black as in my goddamn shoe. Egypt's on the coast of Africa. It is not some small village in Sweden. Making up shit. They always stop that bullshit. Don't want us to have no credit. That bitch was black. All them cornrows and that makeup and that nigga gold. And them big titties and that little waist, that big ass nigga ass. That bitch, bitch was built like a brick shit that she was, she wore them out. She went up into Rome. They'd never seen nothing like that. That black and that goddamn pretty. She seduced Rome. Rome. She entered Rome with all that shit. She seduced them. She was an arrogant black bitch. Shit. Caesar was like 90 or something, 10 minutes older than goddamn dirt. They didn't even think Caesar could still screw. Wasn't no Viagra and all that shit. They didn't even think he could still screw. She turned it out. Let him in that black forest. He couldn't handle it. Lick it. Lick it, Caesar. Lick it. Eat that salad, Caesar. The rest is history.